we're so honored and so blessed um, on this journey to meet so many like-hearted people. And uh, one of the things that's, that's amazing, I, I love meeting spirit-filled, Holy Ghost, charismatic, on-fire believers in the political realm. There's not a ton, uh, but whenever I meet them and connect with them, I, I just feel like we're cut from the same cloth. And when I first ran... Um, for Congress, I mentioned Mike Huckabee was somebody that really got behind me and, and wrote me my first ever, uh, he maxed out you know, a check and his endorsement, and he had me come on his show, and he just did everything he could to really get my back. Another one of those amazing people was David Harris Jr., and he really got behind me and just was such a brother, uh, you know, really supported me, encouraged me. Same thing as the Let Us Worship journey continued. And so he's just been a dear friend. He loves the Lord. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He sees uh, through the eyes of the Father. And so we're just so honored. Boise, Idaho is so honored to have him with us today. Come on, why don't you give him a welcome as he comes up here. And he's got a pink shirt. Show his softer side. Yes. Thank you, Sean. What's up, Idaho? Or more specifically, Meridian? Right? Any Boiseans in the house? All right, it's kind of a mixture then, huh? Are you kidding me? What? How many of y'all are not familiar with me? Let me see. Good. Y'all get an introduction today. They're like, who's this brother and why is he here? Well, I'm going to tell you in a little bit of time I've got. We're done at 2, right? 2.30, 3, 4? I won't have black church. But I come from a black church. My grandpa was a Kojic, uh, a Church of God in Christ, Kojic minister for 53 years. And my dad took over for him. I got saved in that church. And then I was like, man, church is long. <laughs> they don't put an ending on it. Holy Spirit's still moving. And a lot of times he is, but sometimes he's moving to lunch. <laughs> he's like, I'd really like to congregate around you guys when you're having lunch. But it wasn't that. It was, uh, it was that I then went to a church called Bethel. I don't know if y'all heard of that church in Reading. And uh, I'd kind of go back and forth to my grandpa's church and then Bethel church. And then Bill came. And when I heard Bill Johnson speak, I was there. My wife and I were there the very first night Bill Johnson spoke. I was wrecked. And I was like, that's it. This is home. This is church home. So I'm thankful, obviously, for my Kojic roots. But uh, at that time, Bethel was actually Assembly of God. And uh, it's interesting that both Assembly of God and Kojic came out of the same Revival, the Azusa Street Revival. And then there's some details in the history, but basically the black folks went and had Kojic and the white folks went and had Assemblies of God. Well, here I am. My mama is white and my dad is black, so I guess I'm, a, I'm the embodiment coming back together of those things, right? But that ain't what got me started in this trajectory that I've been on where I've been to the White House I don't know how many times. I've been to Mar-a-Lago. I don't know how many times. Um, I've got to interview President Trump on my podcast twice. So I'm thankful that Jay put it out there that uh, we're some Trump supporters up in here. I've been labeled a white supremacist. Okay. All right. All right. Been called all the names from Uncle Tom to... All the stuff that's just derogatory. And uh, actually, even just today, I was called one of those names on social media. But, uh, but that's not the stuff that hurts. The stuff that hurts is when my dad's side of the family, which is the black side of my, my family, when I really started to come out to champion who I believe Donald Trump was before he won the presidency, I was championing before that. One of my uh, cousins that I'd spend a lot of time with, uh, my, my first cousin's husband, and they had two boys, they have two boys. I'd spent a lot of time at their house in Oakland, California. And not too long after I came out championing Trump and all the lies that would come out on social media, and, and not even just social media, but the news, more or less, the network news, the stuff I started dissecting to see how they were manipulating truth. How many understand that's the devil's tactic? 
How many understand that was his very first tactic? Oh, God didn't say that you'll die. He just said, if you eat that fruit, well, you'll, this is what he meant. You'll be more like him. And that's what got us into this mess. <laughs> Dealing with sin. Dealing with the flesh. It wants to do what it wants to do when it wants to do it. So that's the, that was the devil's very first tactic. But my cousin was believing those manipulations. He was believing those clips that CNN was rolling and MSNBC was rolling. And he sent me a text message. Again, this is a close family member. He sent me a text message and he said, when did you start hating black people? Really? Really? I said, oh, come on. D. I said, come on, you know me. I love you guys. I'm just championing what I believe. I try to get into stuff, but it doesn't seem, it's funny, the, the phrase is the devil's in the details, but it doesn't seem like he's really in the details because they don't really like details. <laughs> they don't actually like facts and stats and they don't want the details. They just want to be angry and emotional. I'm talking about people, period on the left or people that have believed the lie. So right after the third debate, I'll do a little history, right after the third debate of, of uh, then Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, I was triggered. And I was, I was praying about what I felt God wanted me to speak to you guys today. It was to ask you, what's your trigger? What triggers you? What's your main trigger? I, I have one main trigger. And then they all just kind of flow from that. But my main trigger is something that I've never, ever questioned. As long as I can remember and as long as I've been alive, I have always believed that a baby is a baby. Whether it's inside the womb or two inches on the other side. A baby is a baby. That's my trigger. I've always sensed and had an immense sense of justice for babies to just be able to live. Who in here could imagine anybody harming a little baby? Doing any harm. A slap is light compared to what we're talking about. A punch in the face is light compared to what we're talking about. That's a trigger for me. I've never even... Never had any other thoughts other than that a baby is a baby. And who in their right mind would ever harm a baby? So when I began to hear Donald Trump talk and I looked at him as a businessman, successful international business mogul, I'm like, a businessman handling the country as a business would be a good thing. We need that over a politician. But when I began to hear him speak about his thoughts on abortion, even at one point going so far as to say women that have mid or late term abortions, I forget specifically what he said, but he said women that have abortions should possibly face criminal, criminal prosecution. I said, can I say this in here? Damn. I said, he gets it. I'm sorry, I'm not a pastor or a preacher, so. I didn't actually say it, but I do live near Shasta Dam, or I did, in Redding, California. I said, he gets it. And at the same time, Hillary Clinton, who embodies the ideology and the beliefs of the Democrat Party, wasn't just Hillary, 
She was vocalizing what they believe. She was saying that babies don't deserve any rights at any point during a woman's pregnancy, even up to the point of birth. Are you kidding me? Evil. It's evil. Pure evil. So after the third debate with Trump and Hillary, I still remember where I was at. I had a Facebook page. I had maybe, I don't know, 1,000 or 1,500 friends. But as soon as the debate was over, I just hopped on Facebook and I just went live. I was so overcome with the, the moment in time that our country was at in that moment, which we're in a very similar but different one right now, but I was so overcome with where we were at in that moment, having the opportunity to either vote for Trump or vote for Hillary, that I said, I just have to share what's on my heart. And I got on Facebook and I ranted. Anybody done that? I don't mean typing ranted, I mean got on video and ranted. Who's done that? Who's wanted to do that? Look at all those hands that went up. All of y'all should do that. Every single one of you that raised your hand, you need to do it. I'm telling you, you need to. That's a personal challenge for me to every single one of you. And I'm gonna ask Pastor Mark here, I'm gonna get all y'all names too. You're recording this, right? We can get who raised their hand. If you have felt the urge or desire to rant on something and you are a spirit-filled believer, friend, do it. Do it in the moment. Don't think about it. Don't think, well, am I going to say it right? Well, what is this person going to think? What if I get something? Just do it. Steal Nike's logo from them because they probably got it from the Bible anyway. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. I did it. As soon as the debate was over, I hopped on Facebook, turned my phone around, set it there on the table, had it propped up, and I went off. I said, as a Christian, because it's Christ first, as a husband, because I'm a married, husband, married man for 28 years now, actually, my high school sweetheart. As a father, because we have two baby, we have two girls, not babies anymore, they're 24 and 26, and now, if I did that video, I'd have to say in a grandfather. So we have an almost four month old baby. Y'all asked me if I had any slides to put up about my speech, I should have just put up a picture of my granddaughter, we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Nothing else like it in the world, literally. No words, no words to describe being a grandparent. As a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a business owner, because I've been an entrepreneur since I was 20, started my first company when I was 20 years old, and as a member of the black community. And can I tell you it's in that order for me? My identity is not in my skin color. Period. Nor should any of us ever allow or promote or allow to exist the ideology or belief that anybody should look at anybody else based on the color of their skin. That also is evil. So I ran it 14 minutes and I'd shared videos before. They'd get maybe 500, 1,000 views, 2,000 views on like, wow. That video was very much pro-life. It was on the next President will be choosing two, maybe three Supreme Court justices, which will, well, which did end Roe v. Wade at the federal level. Are you kidding me? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But back then it was, now understand this, had Trump not a won, it would not have got overturned. Anybody in here that has an issue with Trump and you're pro-life or a believer, you better repent. <laughs> and thank God that despite you and maybe in your vote that he still got in office. Because it would not have gotten overturned. But at that time, it was the next president is going to have the opportunity to pick two, maybe three SCOTUS judges. And, a, and, a, and I shared some other stuff. But it was a very overarching video on pro-life and protecting the unborn babies and understanding that we would play a role in what would take place in our country.
based on who we voted for. And that video hit 50,000 views that night. 100,000 views the next morning. 200,000 views the next night, 24 hours later. 300,000, 400,000 views a few days later. And my inbox was flooded with from men, women, black, Asian, Hispanic, white, Native American, you name it. So many messages. It was all brand new to me and I was just trying to read as many as I could, read as many as I could, and reply to as many as I could. And an overarching theme in these messages from people of all colors, both men and women, because that's all there is. <laughs> People, people's messages that I read over and over again was, I'm a Democrat, my whole family are Democrats, and I was gonna vote for Hillary until I watched your video. And I get a little choked up when I say that because I, I like to think I'll wait till we get to heaven and I can get a big, you know, 200 foot HD reality TV <laughs> in heaven to actually go back and see. But I'd like to think in my own little way, God used that little video in the moment when I was feeling passionate about my trigger. He used that video to swing the needle even just a little bit for the next president of the United States. And even more so than that, after that, I really felt like I heard Papa talk to me. Who else calls him Papa? Who calls him Daddy? Who thinks we're crazy? <laughs> It's a whole nother story. It's a whole nother message of why I call him Papa. I used to think when I heard that, it was like, well, that's not reverent enough. He's the father. And, and, then, and then I had an encounter with him and things changed. But that's another message. But I made that video in the moment and I felt like I heard Papa say to me, even if you can change one person's mind on abortion and save just one baby will it be worth it I said yes daddy and so I just kept on making videos so that's what I mean when I'm saying to you for every person that raised their hand and maybe you didn't raise your hand but there's something that's triggered you where you felt this righteous indignation rise up inside of you and you felt like you had to share a message, kick fear in the face and make the video. I didn't have a tripod. I didn't have lighting set up. I had my phone propped up on a lamp trying to make sure it wouldn't just stop so I could record. It wasn't even recorded, it was live. I went live. And that's led me to be a part of President Trump's campaign. I was on Black Voices for Trump in 2020. I've got to see some and meet some amazing people, including the president. But I'll tell you, the greatest blessing of all of it actually came about a year after I made that first video when a friend of mine I hadn't spoken to in years, he sent me a message, he sent me a DM. And he said, David, I had a friend that was pregnant and she was contemplating having an abortion. And he said, I, I didn't know if I'd have the right words to say, but I watched your video. He said, so I just shared your video to her. And I kept scrolling, it was a picture of a little baby. He said, here's little baby Ian. She had the baby. Are you kidding me? Yes. I love that more than getting to meet Trump or going to Mar-a-Lago or the White House or anything. I got to play a role in the eternity of that little baby. So my question to you is what is your trigger? 
You can take your pick now. It's not just abortion. Now it's at the state level. Certain states, they're still doing it. Partial birth abortion, they're still doing it. What is your trigger? Talking to four, five, six-year-old kids about sex? Imagine a few years ago, if even just a few years ago, a teacher, if a teacher was found talking to a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old about sex, not LGBTQ, alphabet gang stuff, just sex, there'd be an uprising. Now they're talking all this other gender dysphoria stuff, confusing children. It is child abuse. The enemy is coming after the next generation of our children, friends, of your family's kids, of your friend's kids. What is your trigger? Is it the influx at the border? The wide open border that's not being taken care of. That apparently DC and New York are actually finally starting to say, I actually don't like all these busloads of immigrants getting dropped off of here. That's, that's actually not, why is Abbott doing that? Well, you think? You think Texas likes it? You think Arizona likes it? If you don't know what I'm talking about, Governor Abbott has been busing, filling up busloads of these illegals when they come across the border and he's sending them to DC. And he's sending them to New York. And now the mayors, Bowser and the New York mayor, now they're whining. They're saying, wait, wait a minute. We don't want all these Ill illegal immigrants just roaming our city. Well, close the border. What is your trigger? I don't know what yours is. And you can have more than one, yes. But for me, when it came to being pro-life, it was, it was made even more concrete in my life when I found out, when my wife found out as her mom was battling cancer and hospice was coming into our house and my wife's mom was in her final weeks and she lost that battle and went to heaven. But a few weeks before she did, her sister, my, my wife's aunt, came over to help. And my wife's mom kind of just said to her, uh, my wife's aunt said to her sister, my wife's mom, aren't you glad, Jeanette, that you left the abortion clinic and had Jennifer? My wife never knew that she almost didn't get to be here. I was pro-life before that, but that made it a whole lot more personal. <laughs> so what is your trigger? You got to know what it is and you got to know the details. You got to be able to speak on it, about it, feel comfortable speaking about it, know why you believe what you believe. Know the answers that the liberal media and Democrat scholars have tried to give to make their case. Norma McCorvey, the woman in Roe v. Wade came out way later in life and said, I was lied to, I was misused, and I don't believe in abortion any longer. Did we hear about that? You tell that to anybody that's trying to make up their mind or is seriously on the fence and you send them down that rabbit hole and they're gonna wake up. Or at least they're gonna have a lot more reason to question why they believe what they believe. Well, it's just a clump of sales. Really? Do clumps of cells have heartbeats? Can they feel pain? They have their own DNA, fingers and toes. Well, it's the woman's body. Tell me, if I can show you this diagram of a woman here and the baby in the woman's body, what part of the woman's body is that baby? Yeah, 
And then as Jake said, when you can show some of these videos from live action, where they show what a late trimester abortion looks like. You know, when I had the opportunity, when we all had the opportunity to vote for Barack Obama as the first black president, I was actually excited when I first heard that. Anybody else in here excited when they first heard it? Because you knew already, right, what I didn't know yet. I was excited, and then, and then my mom said, David, God bless godly mothers with godly wisdom. She didn't tell me what to do or who to vote for. She didn't tell me who to vote for. Oh, the black community, unfortunately, has had too many generations just telling them this is who you vote for. This is who you vote for. I'm thankful I wasn't a part of that. But a lot of my friends, black friends, they said that's just how it was. You vote for the Democrats, period. That's just who we vote for. My mom said, David, go look at how Barack has voted on the issues that matter to you. Yes, yes, yes. Mm, okay, that makes sense. And when I saw that he was in favor of partial birth abortion, and when I saw that he voted against a bill that would have provided medical treatment to babies that survived abortion, I said, I don't care what color he is. He's not getting my vote. See, the trigger in me politically, I was pretty apolitical before Barack. And then I obviously was really on the scene with Trump. But the trigger in me was kind of being warmed up. But then that third debate, it just broke loose. So as I was praying about what message to talk about with you, it's what's your trigger? What is your trigger? And then understand that every individual has triggers. Your friends, your family. How many of you have friends that stop talking to you because of your politics? How many of you have family that stop talking to you because of your politics? So that's a lot of people, right? With the hands that were raised, that's a lot of people know how to effectively communicate at least your trigger. And then if you can pick up some more, pick up some more, right? Because whether it's you that gets to talk to one of your friends or one of your family members or not, maybe it's, it is somebody else's friend. It is somebody else's family member. Some good news from that cousin of mine that I shared that sent me that text, when did you start hating black people? Late last year, he sent me another text. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but the message was basically kind of like uh, uh, a peace offering. It's actually, if you know black folks, if they're mad at you, they won't text you at all. That's nah, they ain't just black folks. But especially most black folks, at least, at least the ones in my family, if they're mad at you, they're not talking to you, they're not texting you. So the fact that he texted me was just like a peace offering. Because we didn't even talk about politics. We talked about other stuff. But that tells me that somebody planted some seeds that grew in his heart, that woke his mind up, and opened him up to the reality of what was real. So whether it's your own family or your own friends, know your trigger. And if you've wanted to make a video and you haven't made one yet... The next time Holy Spirit gives you that unction, turn it on and make that video. And then the fact that you are in such a, uh, an area with the honor and the blessing of having Pastor Mark and Dee for this church. Hopefully you have a church like this. I can't wait tomorrow. I'm speaking tomorrow. This, this is more of a political type message with a little bit of heaven filtered in, right? That's how I roll. But I'm going to preach tomorrow. But the fact that you've got this house here with these pastors, these leaders, that stayed open during COVID, defying the mandates, kicking fear in the face, and giving the community a place to come and get together, these are the churches that are going to continue to grow and explode. These are the churches. 
Some churches are playing catch up. Some churches, I know most churches shut down initially because it was like, what's, let's figure out what's going on, right? But then a lot of them stayed closed. You know what my thoughts are on that? They should have never been open in the first place. That's my honest opinion. Because they were probably creating nothing but a bunch of lukewarm believers anyway that don't kick fear in the face, that just take up pews, that don't ask God for more, that don't ask God, why am I here? In this moment in history, why am I here, God? And if we're not doing that, if we are all not doing that, if we're not asking God, why am I here? Why am I alive at this moment in time in history? We're missing it, we're asleep. That's why I love the theme of this, Awake America. Which I've been using hashtags under my posts for a long time on Instagram, Wake Up America. America is the frog in the lukewarm water and the water is now boiling. And if you know the end of the story, a frog won't jump out once it boils, to, it'll just boil to death. We are in hot water. And the answer is not politics. It will help for sure. Having godly people in positions of power and leadership, absolutely, you bet you're behind. But if all we have is a strong, conservative, Republican base, and we forget who we are as a nation that was founded on Judeo-Christian values, and we forget that people have souls that will live for eternity, then we've lost it. We've missed the, we've missed the boat. We are each called to have our own impact wherever God's placed us. Every single one of you in this room, you've been called and tasked with having an impact. I can't tell you what that is. I can't tell you where it's at. But I just want you to know you have been called and tasked. If you're not a believer, we're glad you're here. But there's so much more. It is a spiritual battle that we are in right now. Unless you have the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. Unless you understand what those weapons are, you, you can't effectively fight in this battle. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you being here for the fight. But the ultimate battle is spiritual.